She thinks that Singaporeans were first refugees. She believes that the nation must contend with the global issue of forced migration. She's an advocate for the stateless and displaced, and even founded a voluntary group, Advocates for Refugees Singapore. She's Matilda Ho. Welcome, Matilda. Hi, Valerie. Thanks for having me. Thanks for joining us. So let's get right down to the issue. Um, but before we do that, I want to know, uh, for, for people who are not too familiar with Advocates for Refugee SG, AFR SG for short, um, could you share briefly what you do? Just very briefly. Yeah. So Advocates for Refugees, as you mentioned, is a ground-up movement. Um, we focus on uh, raising awareness and we also have been working on different areas of research and most importantly, to inform the public on how they can support refugee communities in the region. I was wondering whether as a nation, we're ready to deep dive into this issue because there's still this overwhelming sense of aversion towards economic migrants, your low-wage migrant workers. Um, you know, even your high-wage migrant workers, there's this overwhelming sense of xenophobia, if one wants to put it. Do, do you think we're ready then to talk about refugee issues? Mm. I would say definitely we have to kind of take a few steps back before even considering uh, refugees, right? The notion of refugees is, seems very distant from us, but we have to really remember that it's a transboundary issue and just right across the causeway in, in Johor Bahru, there are refugees residing there. So we can't really be uh, sheltered from this global crisis. Um, but I, I, I do agree with what you mentioned in that, uh, you know, Singaporeans or people in Singapore are still um, having degrees of xenophobia towards the others, right? The, the migrants, the economic migrants and positioning ourselves as like Singaporean first. I think we do need really to, to think really what it means to be uh, Singaporeans, being a state or being a nation state uh, uh, formed by migrants formerly, like our ancestors are actually migrants from the region, from China, from India, from Southeast Asia. And so I think it really requires for us to think deeper into what that means. I see what you mean. I think from a principle level, that makes a lot of sense. But from a practical, so to speak, level, Singapore is too small. Do you think us being too small is going to make it hard for us to contribute effectively? Mm. I think um, I remember in 2015, uh, the Ministry of Home Affairs actually issued a, a response stating that Singapore is not able to accept refugees due to limited land space. That really stuck with me because I think um, given our uh, short history of 50 over years, we've seen that Singapore has grown in size uh, based on you know, land reclamation and also we're actually building upwards. So you have got high rise and, and so I think the, the reason uh, for the limited space is really uh, pretty ironic in a sense because we do also on every year basis have new citizens in Singapore. So it really is what we value, what we choose to value as a society. So let's unpack that a little bit. You mm. said that there is a bit of a stigma mm -hmm. um, and you see that gradations, right? You know, we want people, we want a population increase, but we don't want refugees necessarily. And this stigma comes from, you're saying, our values. Um, what do you think drives these values? And more importantly, who drives these values? Mm. So I consider um, us as Singapore, I think we, we do have our identity as uh, a nation state. We also have our identity within the larger context of the region. So if let's say you really consider what our position or what our role is within the region, it is with uh, the intergovernment uh, you know, uh, organization ASEAN. And ASEAN has always put forth a, a very strong, uh, or rather what has made it successful, some say it's due to our very strict policies uh, or uh, the principles of non-interference. So, you know, domestic issues are to be handled by the, the, the specific uh, countries. And, and so I think that's also played into how we have been responding to the crisis in the region as a whole. Uh, if we kind of take, uh, uh, rewind to the 70s um, post-Vietnam War, uh, Singapore, has actually, Singapore has actually hosted Vietnamese refugees for around, around 20 years. Uh, up to 1996 when the camp at Sembawang Hawkins Road Camp finally closed. And, and it was since then that Singapore has taken a very strong 
position in saying like no more refugees and and I think it has to do not just with um, how we needed to focus on Singapore's development and back then Singapore was a de- was still a developing country I see so you're saying moving beyond just um, Singaporeans not wanting to accept there's also this overwhelming sense of Singapore la- operating within ASEAN and Singapore not wanting to interfere this passiveness mm. Why is there this passiveness? In the region, we have to recognize that uh, the, the largest uh, uh, population that has been de- displaced are the Rohingyas, and they originate from Myanmar. So this, given, given just this one statement that I say, essentially, there are people who will refute and say that, hey, no, they are not from Myanmar. They are actually from somewhere else, right? But they happen to be on Myanmar territory. And, and this is, there's a history to this, but I think... Uh, if we kind of look at this specific crisis uh, on its own, uh, I would question really what is Singapore's relationship or bilateral relationship with Myanmar? Um, and, and again, what are some of what's at stake? And a lot of what happens on the ASEAN level is, at the, is between states and a lot of times, uh, you know, common uh, ordinary citizens like us may not be privy to this information as well. So I'll be interested to understand really what, what, what's the, uh, what, Singapore and Myanmar works on together mm, uh, mm. and whether there's any discussion on this I'm sure there are discussions that happen likely bet- behind closed doors so this mm. is something that we really need to find out to better understand how we can forward this or how mm. we can maybe take a different approach moving forward mm. yeah I think what you said um, about you know when you say Rohingyas are from Myanmar some people will contest that and it's true because one of the scholars um who has been working on this issue for many years has said this, um, and I quote, most outsiders tend to largely ignore historical narratives, wanting to focus on the contemporary problems driving the conflict. Do you think that possibly one reason why we are passive outsiders is because we don't feel as outsiders, we truly understand the historical context? I think... uh... To some extent, I, I, I choose to disagree with, uh, with what the scholar has mentioned. To, to, to look forward, we kind of have to look back and see what has happened in the past, like what transpired. There are certain things that are really uh, facts and, and, and you know, if you can kind of trace back on, on how the, the, the territories in the region were being drawn up, uh, you would see that, you know, that state, Arakan state actually did, uh, or the Arakan kingdom actually did exist. Um, very little uh, information is is available on that though, but there are scholar uh, scholarly articles and research being done in that area to, to show that you know these people were from that land and this land is become what is today Burma and for them to re- for them to reject for Myanmar to reject them as citizens uh, it went through a systematic process. In fact, um, they were initially citizens of Myanmar of Burma, but you know due to changes in the citizenship law, they were actually denied. Uh, their, their citizenship was sort of even revoked from them. So, so you know, they, it, it, is, uh, it is something that the state has chosen to do. What reason we, we can't be sure. From another person's point of view, somebody who might not be into refugees issue, they would say, this is way too complex. There are two competing truths. I don't know what is right. I'd rather not support it. Do you think that's fair? Uh, definitely not from my personal uh, point of view. Why? I would, yeah, I would uh, think that, like I mentioned, because the issue of forced migration or forced displacement is, is something that involves more than one country, right? When, when someone actually uh, has fear for his, his or her life and, and crosses a, a border, they become a refugee. And it's not a matter of one country. It's not a one country's issue anymore. It concerns more than a country. So where they choose, where they are being hosted currently and where them, they might eventually be resettled. Um, so, you know, as much like I mentioned right at the beginning, we can't shelter ourselves from this issue given that, oh, we don't know which side to take. I, I think it's really, uh, it, it's not a matter of which side you choose to take, but it's really understanding and, and not really just hearing uh, listening to what people want you to believe in. So I think media has a lot, uh, at, at, uh, a, a big role to play in this. Uh, you know, we receive news from media sources, if it's local, if it's international. It, tr- it tells us a certain way we, they want us to perceive the issue, right? So, mm. so, it, so I think in the early days, 
I'm referring to maybe about five years ago, you would hear a lot about the European crisis, about, about the, the Syrian refugees fleeing and, and moving towards Europe. And people really feel like, hey, that's an issue that's very far away. And it's really far, much more distant and maybe there's really nothing that I can do. But look, the issue that we are talking about is the regional issue. And I think it's something that will, will continue to haunt us for the decades you know, or in our lifetime if we don't do anything about it. So, mm. so whether or not we choose to agree or disagree, I think it's something that we need to talk about so that we can really move forward. I see. So now, if we want to talk about moving forward, it sounds like we desperately need some form of leadership or somebody to want to own the problem. Because you said that a lot of times it's, you know, within the ASEAN region, there's this idea of non-interference. Even within Singapore, there's this idea of not in my backyard. So who do you think should own this problem? I don't think it's an, a single person, but it, it's a collective action, right? A, a collective effort that requires, um, you know, people or important world lead, uh, regional leaders uh, being able to sit together to really talk about this. Uh, really just putting aside the, the idea of non-interference to really understand what are the issues. I don't think it's also just the responsibility of the, of the leaders in the region to speak about this, but it also requires uh, citizens like us to... To, uh, to demand for accountability, right? To say like, we want, uh, we, want to, we want to know what's the resolution to this. We want to know what's the development to this. We want to know, or, or really why, I, I don't think there is an answer as to why this, uh, this group or this population of over a million were denied citizenship overnight, right? Many of them uh, have documents from uh, their grandparents or their great-grandparents um, and they're clearly stated as citizens of the state. So why and being is it, the Rohingyas. Yes, yes. So why is it that, you know, uh, due to the change in the citizenship law that all this were, um, all this were denied uh, from them, you know, and, and so, uh, you know, we need to talk about, about this, not just at uh, expecting leaders to talk about it, but I think at many different levels, we can talk about it at, at, the, uh, at the level of businesses, like, you know, there are companies that may choose to work uh, in Myanmar and, and, you know, do they understand the, is the issue, right? Are we, are we kind of like uh, encouraging all this uh, so-called, uh, this, this behavior to continue and, and, and all that. So it's not, just, it's not just one person's issue. Yeah, it requires us to work together, uh, to work towards solutions. So it sounds like you feel that there is a clear right and wrong here. There's a, there's a, um... Myanmar being evil, and then there's the Rohingyas being victimized. Um, if somebody were to offer a different perspective during your entire conversation, because you say having conversations is so important. So throughout the conversation, you realize that actually your perspective changes. Do you think um, you would take a different approach then and you would just drop this entire refugee activism um, mm. cause? I don't, I don't truly and only think that uh, the, the, the government of Myanmar is at fault. I think there's a lot more that we really need to, uh, a lot more nuancing that uh, we need to really get down to. Um, so I, I would be, in fact, very keen to have conversations with, uh, with what others, uh, what, what, the, what the others have to say, right, um, uh, about, about this issue. Um, I think what I have seen so far, uh, not truly having a, had a conversation with uh, any any Burmese about this issue uh, is that you see a lot of uh, negativity on, on social media. You're seeing that they are really commenting to say like, you know, they are, uh, the Rohingyas are rapists, they are criminals, they, they do all this thing to, to, to damage uh, uh, the good name of, of uh, you know, Myanmar and they should not even exist, right? So I think we also really need to be discerning of the kind of arguments uh, that they put forth. I really think that having a discussion is not just uh, proving a, a point, but, but really uh, what, what, what's your basis for all this as well. Mm, I see. That's great. So thanks for sharing and thanks for starting this conversation with us. And um, to all of our viewers out there, if they want to join the conversation, where can they do it? So um, we have uh, AFRSG. We have um, ongoing events and campaigns. And we know largely what we have to focus on right now is really to get conversations going. But of course, it's not just, not just us at Advocates for Refugees, but it's also counting on people to have conversations with 
with you know their networks. It could be it could be Valerie. After this, you speak to someone you know about it, and then the conversation grows from there. So having all these multiple conversations ongoing helps us to really get somewhere. But if if uh, individuals are interested, uh, they can actually uh, follow us on uh, you know our social media and and you know there's some resources that we have on our website as well. It's really important to take the first step forward. So so hopefully um, you know we, we can we can continue this and and continue to inspire um, you know people. It doesn't matter if you're a Singaporean if you're if you're somewhere from where you are. There's definitely something that you can do. So reach out to find out where are the the nearest uh, organizations supporting displaced communities and you know you can really just get started uh, quite right away. Thanks for sharing Matilda. Thank you.